Hey, I want to start with a pretty bold question, um, challenging question for us all. So, Ella, um, I'm going to parse this out a bit. How many of you here have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? There was a point in your life, maybe it was recent, as some have done, maybe it was years ago, where you came to Christ and you understood that He came as God in the flesh. He lived the perfect life for you because you couldn't. So as your substitute, he lived out the life that he's called us to live. And then he died on the cross to pay the punishment for our sin because we could not and cannot. So now we are not condemned. We're not under the punishment of the wrath of God. But instead we have access to him. You've come to understand that you've received it by faith, not through your works. And you're, you have followed him in believer's baptism. To proclaim to the world, not to hide out or privately make that decision, but then to come publicly and say, I am following Jesus. He is Lord. I desire for him to be leader of my life. If you've done that, if you haven't, no worries. We're so glad you're on the journey with us. If you've done that, just raise your hand right where you are if you have done that. Now, here's some things I can assume about you. Immediately. Like, we're brothers and sisters. I've met brothers and sisters all around the world, all over the globe. And the moment I know you're a believer, I know a lot about you. Right? Like, immediately, it's like, yes! We're in the same family. We have the same father. I know that you are seeking to grow in him. I know that you're, by your presence, you're here because you sense that it's very important to gather with other believers. To worship him together. You're not alone. I assume that you're also diving into community with other believers, seeking to follow the Lord and to grow in Him, because you don't do this alone. I assume that you're praying every day. I assume that you're in the Word of God every day, because this is how He speaks to us, and you love Him, and you love His Word and what it does in your heart, get you set on what is true. See, I can assume a lot of things about you. But I also know this is true. It's true of me, it's true of all of us. You have failed. You have failed along the way. Even after you've committed your life to him, you have failed. And for some of us today, and this gets rather tender for all of us in varying degrees, some of us wrestle every day with failure, we, we enter into self-condemnation constantly. Some of us go back to that particular sin, that one sin, the great sin. And every time we think of it, even still, it brings shame, it brings heartache. If we could go back, we would change the story. Because we all have that one. We all have a season, perhaps, or... Many decisions we've made, and we've hurt people. We've been hurt by others. Some of us feel that we've been disqualified because of something that's happened in our lives. And today we're looking at a man who found himself in that kind of a situation where it was his big sin. This was his big failure. And it became public, as often is the case. And even more so, what happened so often this was the one thing that he said he would never do. And he did it. It's the story of Peter that we find in John chapter 21. It's a famous passage and maybe you know this story. This is one of my favorite stories in all the Bible. And what we're going to see here is how God's grace meets us in our failure. So we don't have to keep going back to our failure. And then how to wrestle with sin issues or problems every day single day because we all fail and how do we stay on this trajectory towards Jesus we're going to see there are three seasons or three pivotal moments where we need to extend grace to ourselves when we're disoriented that's what sin does to us when we're reoriented as Jesus starts to reveal more about himself and then when we're appointed when he calls us back to get back in the game and I'm challenging all of us to do so uh, today with the Bible in front of you because you're going to need it um, you look at John 20, for instance, at the end of John 20. It looks like the end of the book. If you were to read that, you may know that, that little passage there. It looks like he's wrapping it up. 
But if we didn't have the rest of the story, was that Paul Harvey? The rest of the story in John 21, we would get to Acts. We would read the book of Acts, chapter 1, all the way through uh, chapter 12, when we go, what happened to Peter? Like, what in the world? Last we left him, he had denied Jesus three times, said he'd never do it. He committed his life, said he would die for him in front of all the disciples and everybody else. And then he blew it completely. Started cursing in the end that he didn't even know Jesus. What happened to him? We see it here in chapter 21. This is the catalytic moment in his life. And it's the catalytic moment, you, we could say, of the early church. First, we extend grace to ourselves. If you want to write this down, take notes here. When we are disoriented. The disciples are so disoriented at this point, And Peter is in particular. So look at this, verse 1, after this. Okay, always important. We're going to learn at the pastor study every Wednesday night. How do we faithfully read scripture? First thing, what's the context? Like, how did the first hearers hear this? And what was going on in the text? This is where it all began. After this, after the resurrection. But this is where it all started. Some of us have this spot etched in our memory. Um, our group that went to the Holy Land. This is on the north shore of, of um, the Sea of Galilee. We actually stayed in the hotel right there. So I have this place in my mind, along with many of you. We're going back again, by the way, um, next fall. Not, not coming up the next. Um, we'll hear, you'll hear more about that. I'd love for you to come with us. But we actually go to this spot, stay a few nights. But after this, this is where Jesus had called the disciples three years earlier. Same, same area, same spot. Could it be the place they loved to go? This after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. This is the Sea of Galilee. And he revealed himself in this way. This is, by the way, the third time. He's already seen, they've seen him twice resurrected. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, and two other disciples were together. There's seven of them here, not all. Judas has now committed suicide. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, hey, we'll go with you. So there's a couple things going on here. That's what he did. He's a fisherman. Some have noted, it looks like he's just going back to what he always knew. Just, I, I blew it with the disciple thing. I'm, I can't do that. I'm going to go back to fishing. Um, I don't know how, how much to make of that. Uh, or, you know, we're just hungry or, or something. But it also shows you the natural leader that he is. We're going with you. He's mentioned first because this story is about him. But he's also the man. He's the one. Though impetuous at times, and we'll see here. They went out and got into a boat, but that night they caught nothing. So they got in the boat, went out, and caught nothing. Now, let's again put this in context. Not only has, have, have their lives changed, uh, we all have this cultural memory, if you will, where we look at a text, oh yeah, Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus, the resurrection happened. They're now at ground zero of where this took place. I mean, I mean at the time. And the reverberations of now the resurrection are going forth. But they're right here at the beginning of it all. They're not sure what their place is. We have the rest of the story. They don't know what's going on. And how do you interface with a resurrected person? Right? There's a lot of weird stuff going on. This passage is kind of awkward. Because it is. They're disoriented. I think John is crafting this story very carefully for us to go, what? And what? And that happened? Jesus is going to show up here, spoiler alert, if you don't know the story. But the kingdom had not come as a political revolution. It didn't come as a national takeover, as they anticipated. So how do they relate to a resurrected man? They're disoriented. It seems Peter is going back to what he knew, because that's what we do when we fail. I'm going back. I tried this. I stepped out. This is why I never step out. I'm not going to do it again. Because I failed. Peter, as much as he would step out, he, maybe he's going back to fishing. He says they fished all night. That's not unusual. Um, they would fish all night, and then you want fresh fish for the market in the morning. You don't have a refrigerator. You don't have a freezer. And so they'd fish all night with a torch often that would attract the fish. And This is not unusual. They fish all night, but they caught nothing. And I, I, I think that it's important to see that that failure can be so disoriented, and so disorienting. And you're already thinking, I want you to think, to apply this text, think about failure in your own life. 
Again, this kind of gets tender for some of us. Maybe it's something you've done recently. Maybe it's the big sin that you need to release and let go of. Because you go back, it's like spiritual whiplash. You go back and go, what a sinner am I? I can't believe it. And I've talked to so many people as a pastor through the years, gosh, even, even in youth ministry and, and such, where people sin or that, again, the great failure. And our failure, our sin is so disorienting that it leads some people to question their salvation. Maybe you've been there. We've all perhaps have been there. How could I have done, if I'm really a Christian, how could I have done this? Or people who want to say, hey, you Christians, you're all just hypocrites. And I'd say, well, you'd have an argument um, if our salvation was based on how good we are. It's not. It's based on how good he is. It's his grace that has changed us. And yes, it should change us, which is what we're going to see today. This should propel us to obedience over and over again. But here we see that Peter has failed and he's filled with guilt and shame, condemnation. And then it says, verse 4, just as day was breaking, so maybe it's still barely, barely much light out. Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus is right here in the midst of their failure. He doesn't look like they thought he would, we're going to see. I mean, he's resurrected. It's Jesus, but it's not Jesus. It's Jesus. It's not the guy that died on the cross, but he's physically here. They're still wrestling. How do you relate? And then Jesus said to them, verse 5, uh, Children, do you have any fish? This word is only used here. He's saying, hey, boys. Bo- hey, boys, caught anything? It's kind of a term of endearment, actually. Hey, hey, boys, fellas. You caught anything? They answered, no. Shortest answer a fisherman has ever given. <laughs> like, no. They don't even talk about the one that got away. They don't talk about the big haul they could have brought in except that Peter, you know, did something crazy. Um, No. Very brief response. And and I think that Jesus, I mean, that's all they've got. No excuses, only failure. That's why he's asking the question. Uh, It's why we we sense this from the Holy Spirit. Um, You know, I, I often ask the question in a sermon. Hey, so we're living the way of the world. How's that going for you? by the way. Is that, is that going okay? No. It's, it's, a, it's to turn us back. It's, it's God in the garden, the first that we hear, okay, after him, let there be light. He says, hey, Adam, where are you? He knew where he was. Second question, did you eat from the tree? I told you not to eat from. He's wanting us, them, the disciples, Adam, to admit our failure. That's why he's asking the question, okay? But don't miss this. Jesus could be anywhere. He's resurrected. He's shown up through walls. He's, you know, if you want to know what our resurrected bodies look like, by the way, look at his. The first installment of the resurrection. The first fruit of the resurrection. He could be anywhere, but he's here in bodily form. He is right here. They, they don't expect him to be here. I don't know that they're looking for him. It doesn't seem like they are. They're they're back to work. But in Mark chapter 16, verse 7, interesting. After Jesus is resurrected, the angel says to the women who first encountered the risen Christ, go and tell my brothers, tell the disciples and Peter that I'll meet them in Galilee. They're supposed to be here. That's why they're here. And a little sub point, the women are the first Evangelists to go proclaim the news to the apostles. Some have called Mary the, the apostle to the apostles. She was the sent one, the evangelist, right? But he's coming after them. Jesus is here. And by now, Peter has learned Jesus is completely unpredictable. And some of us need to hear this today. Jesus does not respond to your failure like you do. He does not respond to that failure you have in mind or that thing that happened to you that you feel marked you now the rest of your life. Jesus does not respond to you like you do. And self-condemnation needs to end in your life because your failure, mine, our sin, does not repel Jesus. It actually triggers his love towards us in his mercy. 
He comes to us. That's why he's here. Look at verse 6. He said to them, hey, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. Kind of ridiculous, but for some reason. So they cast it. They've been, you know, why not? We tried everything else. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. Look, the difference from one side of the boat to the other. Here's another thing you see on our Holy Land trip. We'll get on a boat on the, in the Sea of Galilee, but they'll show you a, a boat at this museum. It looked like it was a first century fishing boat. I mean, it's there. There's a shell of it. But you can see what that would look like, how big it was and all the things. It was probably similar to this. The difference is about 10 feet, maybe. So it's kind of a ridiculous thing to, to cast on the other side. But what's happening here, it wasn't their, their hard work this time around. The difference was not their, their, you know, their resilience or their expertise or their competency. It was their obedience. That was the difference. They're obeying Christ. Now, they don't know yet that it's him. But sometimes we just do what we know to do. Keep pressing it. Jesus is reaching out to us even when we don't even know it's him. So even if you feel that he's far away, friend, he's speaking and again, are you in his word? He speaks. You're here. Way to go. He speaks. See, disorientation means it's from the Latin dis, so a lack of orientation. You've lost true north. You're not oriented anymore. You're disoriented. And after failure that has hurt you or others have hurt you or affected your friends or your family, sin can destroy relationships or cost us a lot. And we lose a sense of direction. I say, I don't know. I don't even know what to do anymore. It's like a lot of our support, you know, the family support group or it's divorce care that we have as well that Dr. Martin leads where a lot, a lot of times we're disoriented and we need to come around others and say, what, what does my future look like? It's fuzzy. I don't know what my circumstances are fuzzy. Even Jesus is kind of fuzzy right now. And the beauty is that Jesus meets us in that place and, and he shows us more of who he is. Now, I've got to stop here and say this. We have a lot more clarity than they did. And this is a challenge for us. We have the blessing of the rest of the story. The, the whole New Testament, all of Scripture, together for us. We have the blessing of His Word. We have the blessing of worship. Way to go. This should be priority every week for you. We have the blessing of our connect groups to come together with other believers, to be encouraged. I blew it this week. Guess what? I did too. Wait, you too? Yes. How are you dealing with that? Let's talk about it. Or how about, no, I'm going to spin off. I'm going to go privately with you brother or sister I need to talk I'm hurting I lost this or this happened to me or how about this it's why we're telling you to read dwell in every single one of us reading dwell this week chapter 8 we read verse uh, 31 through 39 on Tuesday I'm wrestling with self-condemnation hey who will bring a charge against us Paul says who, who's going to come after you wanting to condemn yourself not Jesus who seeks to cancel us? Jesus cancels out everybody else. He cancels out all of our sin, all of our mistakes. We're reading that early. I'm reading that Tuesday morning, Romans 8. I'm going, yes, yes, yes. I'm going to live in that today. You see the power of his word? Are you in it? Take some discipline partnering with him if you're going to be his disciple. Get out of condemnation, self-condemnation by getting his word. So we need to extend grace to ourselves when we're disoriented. Watch this. We, we need to extend grace to ourselves when we're reoriented. Our, our, our disorientation. Now watch this. Their disorientation starts to become a reorientation, a redirection. That's what that is. Look at verse 7. That disciple whom Jesus loved. It's funny. John keeps referencing himself. You want to say, John, just say John. Just say yourself. You outran Peter to the tomb. We know it's you. I mean, it's, you know. Said to Peter. It is the Lord. Because Here's, watch this. They'd seen this before on these same shores. They fished all night. Jesus is calling them to be a disciple. He says, hey, go deeper. They're like, whatever, go deeper. And then they haul in two loads of uh, boat loads of fish. Immediately he goes, wait, we've seen this story before. This is Jesus. That's who that is. It can only be him. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and, and threw himself into the sea. 
So he's just like, he's not playing around. I don't know about you guys. I'm going to go. I'm, that's Jesus. Again, impetuous. And again, awkward story. Why did you put your robe on if you're going to jump in and swim? What? He's not thinking. That's Peter. Um, we don't know why. Uh, but other than I don't want to leave anything on the boat. Like, you guys stand out here. I'm out. Uh, so he jumps in. They're, they're, they're rowing alongside him. I think this is kind of comical. I mean, it's only 100 yards. It says in the next verse, look at this. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net of fish behind them. So they're moving a little slower. For they were not far from land, about 100 yards. They're over there. Just, <laughs> I imagine them ro- rowing, and they're like, Peter, what are you, why, are you, why are you swimming? Okay, well, we'll see you. You know, he's, they're moving on in. And they get there. Notice the details here. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. Wow. So what does a resurrected Savior do? He serves. He's, he's serving them breakfast. How cool is that? John is crafting this story very carefully. I want you to see this. The only other place in Scripture we see charcoal fire. In relation to the story, do you know where it was? In John 18, 18 the first time Peter denied Jesus was outside of Caiaphas' house. And he says in front of the charcoal fire. The only other place. So at night with the glow of the charcoal fire and the, and the distinct smell of the charcoal fire. Peter will now find himself in front of Jesus as the sun starts to rise in front of a charcoal fire. And to eat with someone in this day, you might know culturally it was a very intimate relationship to eat with someone who had wronged you was an act of forgiveness i mean that's even today it's an act of grace verse 10 jesus said to them bring some fish some of the fish that you caught so simon peter simon peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish 153 of them and although there were so many, the nets were not torn. The net was not torn, as if that was a miracle in itself. Large fish. How do we know there were 153 of them? <laughs> Someone counted them. I love that. I can imagine the guys just, just high-fiving each other, like, are you kidding me? You know, not only have they done this all night, but they've never seen anything like this. So they're 152, 153. You know, they're chest bumping or whatever they're doing. They're so excited. And then it says here in verse 12, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dare ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Now, this is funny. Again, awkward. But this is like when you're in class, in school. Um, this would have been me in math class where the teacher does this massive, you know, algebraic formula on the board. And then she goes, and then this is how you get, look, X, X minus Y, this and this. And then she goes, okay, any questions? And I'm so lost. I'm like, I, I don't even know what to ask. I don't even know what to ask. I don't want to be embarrassed. That's what's going on here. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So they don't know what to do with Jesus. He is a massive problem for them. They have no idea what to do. Uh, this is, again, this is Jesus, but not Jesus. Like they, now he's resurrected. What is happening next? So we thought we were with you, but it didn't go like we thought it would. This is when you know you've entered into reorientation. When you start to see Jesus in a new way. He hasn't changed. Not really. No, he's still Lord. But our understanding of him has changed. This is what happens when we sin, when we fail, and we turn back to him. We encounter him. He comes to us. We recognize him. And we have, again, what I call the grace awakening. We understand more fully how much he loves us. Only God can take our failures and turn them into something beautiful. He takes our worst sin, our worst mistakes, and he encounters us. He starts to reorient our lives around a new understanding of who he is. This is a beautiful thing, and this is exactly what's happening with Peter. Now, here's the thing for some of us. Some of us dare not ask Jesus any questions because we think we've got it figured out. 
And he wants to reveal something greater to us. He wants to show us more. Jesus is reorienting your life today, hearing this message through his word. God is doing a new thing in you right now. And he wants to show you like you've never seen how much he loves you. We need to extend grace to ourselves when we're disoriented, when we have failed, when we're reoriented, and when we're, watch this, when we're appointed. Now, I used to think this next section here um, was kind of these questions in rapid succession. If you know this, this is where Jesus, at, I mean, Peter asked him three times if he loves him. Jesus is going to reinstate him again. Spoiler alert. But, but Jesus, I think Jesus is doing this publicly. I think the initial conversation is with the other disciples. I mean, John, no, John's writing this down. John is, is aware throughout, we'll see. I think he ends up with Peter alone for a moment. Maybe they take a walk. I think John is, just imagine this is the case. He, he's actually recording the entire morning. Now it says, look at verse 11, uh, verse 15. When they had uh, finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon, Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? I think they're sitting there around the fire. He goes, hey, so Simon, you love me more than these? Guys? Notice he's not presuming upon it. He's not calling him Peter, even. Petra, the rock. So Simon, son of John, um, you love me more than these guys? You said you did. You said you would. You said you'd die for me. Peter knows he's failed. And they know he's failed. And he said, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. So much has been made about the language here in the Greek uh, that Jesus asked him, do you agape me? Do you love me with the highest kind of love? Or do you, and then Peter answers, I flail you. You know I flail you. Like, which is a high love as well. He said, Lord, you know I love you. Like a great human, high human love. And then Jesus said, no, do you agape me? He says, Lord, you know I fillet you. The last time Jesus comes down to where he is and he says, a uh, third time, do you, uh, do you fillet me? Like, do you love me that, that, even that level? This time, Peter's grieved because he asked him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. Do you know that I love you? Fillet you. He said, feed my sheep. I think that his sin was public. I think he's going to reinstate him publicly. That's what he's doing here. I think he's, he's saying, Peter. And I think the nuance does help us. Jesus is speaking Aramaic. But I, I think the nuance does help us. Where John's crafting this story very carefully saying, here's what, here's what the vibe was. Here was the nuance. Here's what he was asking him. But in the end, I think that Peter is saying, Lord, okay, I blew it. Everybody knows it. I can't hide anymore. I thought I loved you. But I don't even know anymore. Have you been there? Lord, I want to love you. But now I don't even know. He's saying, I don't know. You know. I can't say it because I have this propensity to fail and to fall. And everybody knows it. And I don't even know anymore. The Lord, you know. And in verse 18, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show what kind of death he was to glorify God. He's telling Peter, you're going to, you're going to live. You're going to, in fact, he's telling him this kind of encouraging, strangely, you're going to get back in the game. And you, but you're going to die for me. You said you would. It's actually going to happen. Eusebius, the uh, father of church history, others have written about this. He was crucified upside down, is the way the story goes. And after saying this to him, he said to, 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 to Peter, follow me. Jesus is reinstating him. The same words that he used three years earlier almost could it be this same spot after all they've been through. Peter turned and saw the other disciple whom Jesus loved following them. This is John now. The one who also had leaned back against him during the supper, the Lord's Supper, and had said, the Last Supper, Lord, who, who, 
is it that is going to betray you? He's, he's the one, so he's naming himself. So when Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, uh, Lord, what about this man? Like, what about John? What's up with him? What's going to happen to him? Jesus said to him, if, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? It's been called the witty principle. W-I-T-T-Y. Remember that this week. What is that to you? I mean, it could have been more tender than that, but stop comparing yourself to others. That will only lead to shame and regret. And then the you is in the emphatic. Friends, this is the message for you today. You follow me. You. And you. This is the word of Jesus coming to each one of us to say, whatever you've done, you follow me. Get back in the game is what he's saying. And I'll close with this story before we partake of the Lord's Supper together before we leave this place. Praise be to God. Tom Watson Jr., you might know that name. He was CEO of IBM for many years, 1956 to 1971. He was kind of a legend in the business community, a key figure in the information revolution. Um, We have those who've served or worked at at IBM for years. Um, He was known for kind of some unorthodox leadership moments, kind of surprising uh, moments where he led. But a young executive came into his office after, well actually was called to his office, after losing the company $2 million on some deal his, his team or project was, was working on. And when he was called into uh, Tom Watson Jr.'s office, he brought with him his resignation, assuming he was going to get fired. This is the only time you're going to be called in there. Uh, at least he thought. And so he comes in, he says, here's my resignation before you fire me. Uh, I just want to know I'm sorry. And uh, I, I resign my position. And Tom Watson turns to him, he he tosses his resignation back across the desk and he says, are you kidding me? I just spent two million dollars educating you. I can't afford to fire you. (laughs) And I think that's what's happening here. Peter. I invested three years in you. Friends, listen to this. This is for us. I invested a crucifixion in you. I invested a resurrection in you. A resurrection. Get back in the game. I've done it all so you'll stay with me. Hang in there. Friends, we need grace when we're disoriented. We need grace when we're reoriented by by our Savior. And when we're appointed. And not say, no, I'm not worthy. Of course you're not worthy. That's why I went to the cross for you. And so we thought it'd be an amazing way to close our time together in worship and head out into the week remembering what he's done for us by partaking of the Lord's Supper together. And so now our deacons are going to guide us and we're going to serve each other. We're going to have one pass of the elements and I want you to take your elements. I'll guide us in a moment. When we're all focused together, but while we're, we're receiving the elements from one another, I want you to meditate. I want you to pray. Praise Him for His grace and tell Him how you're going to get back in the game. So let's now partake as you pray. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we ask that you'll bless this time. Even as we confess our sin to you, we thank you for your grace. In your name, we pray.